companies want to do different slash better, they understand that there are consequences to excessive use of, of aggregates in construction or the manufacturing of steel or even in energy. There's a lot of emissions going into the environment and that's causing, causing some negative effects. Uh, regulations are coming in different form or fashion. In the US, the SEC has flagged uh, that they expect companies to be reporting on their carbon footprint. Companies have decided is that they will try to be good corporate citizens and reduce their carbon footprints as much as is possible. There's a carbon footprint attached to every activity. We can't shut things down. We don't want to turn the power off because people rely on it. Everything we touch, taste, feel, and see has to do with the hydrocarbon. So how do we actually address that and try to move the planet forward? The concept of, could I do something that benefits the planet uh, instead? And could I purchase that? And could we quantify that through a metric like a carbon credit? Uh, is what we decided to do. This is the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady, and we talk to sustainable building experts. Today, we caught up with Brent Tolmy, the CEO of Carbon Ethic, a carbon credit provider that improves the forests and the lives of the indigenous communities that they partner with. We talked about what carbon credits are, what they mean for the built environment, and what the future of carbon looks like. But before we jump in, we're helping AEC professionals learn to build with Mass Timber so that they can change the world with their projects at the next Mass Timber Group Summit taking place in Denver. You can save your seat by clicking the link in the show notes below. And if you like these interviews, hit the subscribe button. It's the biggest compliment you can give and it really helps us spread the word about Mass Timber. So with that, let's get into it. Brady, Nick, thanks for having me. Uh, carbon credit is a metric ton of CO2 avoided or sequestered. That is an answer that folks came together about three decades ago to answer, to say, how are we going to deal with these emissions problems that are going on and causing problems around the globe? Uh, so the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change or IPCC came up with this definition so that we could all be on similar playing grounds, whether you're in Canada, the US, Colorado, or British Columbia, Switzerland, or Dubai, doesn't really matter. The definition is the same. How we analyze um, emissions uh, revolves around um, offsetting carbon and carbon dioxide specifically. So that's a, a generic uh, sort of summary answer, but uh, one metric ton of CO2 sequestered or avoided. And why are carbon credits kind of making headlines right now, especially towards like the built environment or from a company's perspective? Why are people looking into carbon credits and why are they buying them? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think it's because companies want to do different slash better. Um, they understand that there are consequences to tailpipe emissions, to um, uh, emissions caused by uh, excessive use of, of aggregates in construction or the manufacturing of steel or even in energy, you know, where we burn coal or, or oil or natural gas, for instance, to generate power. Um, so there's a lot of emissions going into the environment and that's causing, causing some negative effects. Um, to what extent we can argue all day long, um, that's not really uh, core to the answer. Um, but what companies have decided is that they will try to be good corporate citizens and reduce their carbon footprints as much as is possible. Um, but we can't get to zero. And even if you look at a, for instance, a choice to drive an EV, uh, there's a large carbon footprint associated with driving an EV. Perhaps it's less than a, than an ICE, an internal combustion engine, uh, but there's an impact to having to mine for things like lithium and cobalt, transport those minerals across seas to manufacture. Um, we can see that in the house building construction industry as well. There's a carbon footprint attached to every activity to reduce it to zero is impossible. And so the concept of, could I do something that benefits the planet? Uh, instead, and could I purchase that? And could we quantify that through a metric like a carbon credit uh, is what we decided to do um, as a bunch of nations came together um, at Kyoto and, and uh, different accords like that. And of course, we all know here the term, the Paris Accord. Well, that was just countries coming together to say, hey, how are we going to deal with this? And what frameworks can we put together so that companies who can't reduce their carbon footprint to zero, otherwise they wouldn't exist, um, and all humans too, we all have a carbon footprint attached to us existing. So what else can we do 
uh, recognizing that there's a little bit of uh, excess of CO2 going into the environment these days. Hey, we're going to get back to the podcast in just a second. But first, I have a question for you. Are you somebody looking to build a mass timber project? If the answer is yes, then you need to put together an experienced team. Our partners at Cornerstone Timber Frames are leaders in heavy timber construction and have 30 plus years of experience, which means you can trust them to get the job done right. They collaborate with Nordic Structures to bring you the highest quality FSC certified mass timber available. They also have some of the most advanced fabrication technology in the industry, so your project goes up smoothly without costly on-site modification or delays. That means they have the experience, network, and technology to make your next mass timber project a success. Learn more about Cornerstone Timber Frames by clicking the link in the show notes below. I understand why, or excuse me, what a carbon credit is and then why people are purchasing them, but where do they come from? Like, how are we actually... Uh, offsetting those emissions? Are people uh, or companies doing something that takes more carbon out of the atmosphere? Or how does that work? Yeah, two types of, of carbon credits. Uh, one is a, uh, um, a compliance credit. And so that means I'm going to pay a carbon tax. So think of a, a transportation company, think of airlines, uh, railroad, things of that nature, where they just have this unreducible carbon footprint. And so the government comes along and says, hey, I'm going to tax you on the extra carbon that you put out unless you buy these compliant credits that have to come from various projects that develop carbon credits. The other side is this voluntary market, which is I'm an Amazon, I'm a Microsoft, I'm a Shopify. I want to demonstrate that I am a good corporate citizen. So I'm going to voluntarily purchase one of these carbon offsets that comes from these different types of projects. Um, so they can demonstrate that, uh, you know, my Amazon packaging that got delivered, that carbon footprint is being wiped out or offset somehow by a project that's doing good. When we talk about uh, the projects that develop carbon offsets, some are as simple as uh, a city deciding to change their bus fleet over to uh, renewable, uh, uh, renewable gas buses um, so that they can displace the use of, of um hydrocarbons as fuel, or perhaps a good example in Vancouver, where I live, is Harbor Air decided to uh, electrify one of their short haul seaplanes that go over to our capital in Victoria. So it's a great flight. It's about a 20 minute flight. And they said, hey, we've got clean uh, hydroelectric power in, in BC. Let's uh, develop a, a float plane with an electric engine because they're always, they always have short power. Um, so a really neat application. And then they're, they're displacing the use of, of jet fuel. So, or Avgas, and, uh, and so that's a really neat sort of easy way to think about it. Um, another is this direct air capture that a lot of people are talking about. Um, that might be a coal generated uh, power plant that is uh, attempting to catch all the CO2 being released and air scrubbers, things of that nature. Um, Shell in Canada built a direct air capture plant that's at quite a bit large scale, very expensive, very fancy technology. And where we specialize is in nature-based solutions. And that's, hey, can we do things different slash better uh, in the forest? Can we extend the rotation if that's intended to be cut for a sawmill? Can we uh, build some wildfire mitigation so that when a forest fire approaches the forest, uh, it has more resilience and doesn't necessarily burn at the same rate? Because, of course, wildfires are emitting CO2. Um, or, or other techniques such as spacing, pruning, thinning, basically getting trees to grow better, faster, while not necessarily having a negative impact on biodiversity or wildlife. Can you uh, unpack and maybe describe to somebody who has never heard of it before or just doesn't realize maybe what a carbon credit w is or, but what is the carbon ethic? Yeah, carbon ethic was uh, something that we came up with while we were ideating about how we could do things different, better in the forest. And uh, we recruited uh, a, a, a chief of sustainability. His name is Jacques Prescott. So Jacques, um, he's consulted all around the world. He's been in government. He recognizes that government isn't necessarily always the solution. And so he's happy to join our team. And, and it's funny when we found out about Jacques, I'd partnered with Martin Prescott. And I said, you know, we could use somebody with a little bit more uh, scientific or sustainability background to really help guide our thinking while we're thinking about these forest improvement projects. And Martin said, well, I have this cousin. And of course, I immediately thought about, uh, you know, Cousin Eddie from National Lampoons. And, and I thought we were going to get, you know, the typical sort of clown cousin. And instead, we got 
probably one of the foremost uh, sustainability experts on the planet. And Jacques came out of the sustainability movement in Eastern Canada, in Montreal specifically, and Quebec, um, where a prof of theirs took them aside in the 70s and said, hey, you know, things aren't going that well for the planet. There's a lot of things that are negative here. Perhaps you guys should think about devoting your careers to doing things, again, different slash better. And so that started a ride for, for Jacques, who's a trained wildlife biologist. Um, and, and he had developed with his university friends, uh, a, a grid of sustainable development. So, you know, the trouble with sustainability a lot of times is that we can't shut things down. We don't want to turn the power off because people rely on it. Everything we touch, taste, feel, and see has to do with a hydrocarbon. So how do we actually address that and try to move the planet forward without having a big argument that really doesn't go anywhere? So we look at a grid of sustainability um, that weighs out these uh, factors and actually gives a weighting to them. Um, so we look at societal, economic, ecological uh, factors, and, and then we wrap that in a layer of governance. And over top of that sits ethics. So is this good for people? Will this be good in the long run? Is this consistent with seven gen thinking, which is thinking about seven generations out past us? Uh, does it make sense? And so we thought, wow, the ethical piece of this is really powerful. Perhaps that should be an embedded in our name because it's core to who we are as people. And so that's where carbon ethics, the name came from. And you guys use like a, a very sophisticated set of tools uh, that you've developed in-house or, or with partners to kind of measure the actual impact that you guys are having with the force that you work with. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's done? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'd love to jump into the why first. Um, so we sure. st first started, thank you. When we first started looking at the carbon market, we recognized there was a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. And there was a lot of people pointing to the fact that these, these projects didn't perhaps do anything at all. And our friends at The Guardian had done many, many uh, investigative reports on some of these projects that are in Africa and uh, uh, South America that perhaps weren't actually adding any value and that uh, these companies who were voluntarily spending their money um, to support offsetting um, were perhaps not getting anything for their money and the claims were fairly useless. Uh, and we took that to heart and thought, okay, well, if we're going to do things, we're going to get uh, right down deep in science. So we want science-based initiatives that are provable, that are verifiable. And of course, how we do that today is technology. So we went out and looked for world-class drones um, that could fly sensors so that we could analyze and perhaps create a digital twin of the forest and that we could track that over and over again um, to see how those trees are really performing and to judge the efficiency and the effectiveness of our, uh, of our projects, uh, really the three T's for us. So trying to bring, uh, trust, transparency, and, and the third T's in our reliability. Um, but that was our goal uh, to address all this controversy and to make sure that if we were to sell an offset to the mass timber group, uh, to a hardware manufacturer that was making, you know, for perhaps connector bolts or something of that nature through a steel foundry that we're delivering them something that actually brings value and that we can point to the place, we can point to the people that are stewarding that project, and we can point to the impact that those trees have in fact proliferated because uh, we've used technology to prove that. So exciting times, we got to go down to Silicon Valley where they make some of the, uh, the finest drones in the world, uh, US military grade applications, a company called Skyfront. Uh, and Troy, the founder, and we worked with them, uh, bought a couple of Skyfront Perimeter 8s and started testing uh, to build a, a digital twin of a forest. Uh, we bought some high-end uh, LiDAR sensors um, so we could map out the ground, but also recreate a tree uh, somewhat digitally and then bought some high-end uh, cameras as well. So the LiDAR pods are manufactured in Scotland um, and the cameras are, are offshore of some description. I'm not as familiar with those we stack all that technology together. So you get an accurate representation of, of what that carbon is, what the carbon is happening. Uh, what well, if the carbon is increasing in yield and that relies on growth and yield tables in the forest. Um, so we're excited to present that technology. And along the way, we partnered with a company called Genesis AI to help us fast forward that technology. So we work with a team of developers, about 25 strong 
that are helping to bring a real true forest inventory model to the marketplace. Are you getting in there into the environment and changing or experimenting or doing anything to the trees themselves to maybe um, speed up, I guess you could say, like the, the uh, like, are you harvesting anything in there or is it just true to what nature is bringing? And then you're measuring those trees in there and then through a, a scale or a, you know, a mathematical process, you're like, okay, at, we have X amount of pounds of carbon that this area here sequestered. That's a great question, Nick. Um, true forest improvement, uh, involves protecting the forest, uh, through extraction, through pruning, through spacing and things of that nature. So if we, if we step back one step and look at a tree, it's really a solar panel. And it sucks obviously CO2 out of the, uh, out of the air and it converts it into growth. And so how trees grow is, is basically they clean the air and they take that excess CO2 out and pack it onto their trunk and their, their limbs and their leaves. Um, so anytime we're able to add more quadrants of sun to a tree, uh, within a limit, and that's why we need technology to find out what those limits are, uh, we've done a good job. Obviously, we have to pair that with how much moisture that tree is able to, uh, to access. So in, in super dry climates, um, perhaps we do want more shade tolerant species and we do want less access to the sun. Uh, where we work in the boreal forest, uh, very slow growing, uh, lots of the, of the moisture that it receives is actually snow retention. So you don't want to thin the forest out too much. You want to find that healthy balance. And then, of course, building resilience against wildfire. Um, yeah, and I think one of the challenges, you know, before humans got going really fast in terms of development and industrialization, um, the forest really could take care of itself, but, uh, this cycle of warming has actually just been a little bit quicker than the planet's been used to. So, uh, it, the planet earth has been hotter in the past. It's been cooler in the past. What we're concerned about is the fact that it's getting hotter faster than it ever has. And that is really hurting the forest and its natural ability to defend itself, to replenish itself. Um, we take a wildfire, for instance, actually a very natural phenomenon. The issue today is that we have so much excess CO2 that we can't, um, in good conscience, just let forest burns to, to replenish themselves because we already have that excess CO2 from industrialization. So we're out of balance, we're out of whack. And so that's where a carbon ethic comes in, where we try to restore the balance in the most natural way. Of course, you can plant a ton of trees and, and get an impact of sequestering CO2 through a monoculture. So a, a tree stand plantation where everything are in rows, um, but that's really not natural. That's not beautiful. It's not necessarily the best thing for wildlife. Um, so we tend to use as much natural assistance as we can in these forest improvement projects. The other piece is that we're always limited by capital. So there's only so much money that we can do. And so technology allows us to make the absolute best decisions saying, okay, if we space thin this forest, what is the impact? And then grow that forest for the next 30, 40, 50 years to see what the impact really looks like, throw different weather patterns at it, um, throw perhaps a wildfire renewal stage at it and see what happens to the overall forest. Um, so that we can make better decisions and so that we can say we have a limited budget. Should we spend it on this plantation project, uh, you know, adding new trees to the forest or should we spend it over here where the trees have regenerated naturally, but they're as thick as hairs on a dog's back. And we should perhaps let those trees experience more sunlight, um, things of that nature. And so it, there's a lot of scientific discovery in the process. And I think that's important in carbon projects. If they're not actively managing the forest, we're probably losing something. Um, that said, there are a lot of areas that are closed off for conservation and that's fine. We just have to acknowledge that those forests may in fact burn, um, or need to be cleaned up at some point in time. I'll give you a case in point, uh, Stanley park in Vancouver, it was hit with some type of a, of a disturbance event, uh, where a bud. A worm or a bug of some description got into the hemlock trees and now they're having to take out as much as 40 percent of probably what would be considered the crown jewel of vancouver uh stanley park um that's a natural phenomenon so it's not something you can predict or protect against uh it's just something that you have to deal with and so when we conserve areas we shouldn't think that they're set aside and completely protected 
um, but that things will happen that will increase or decrease the carbon sequestration ability of that forest. Yeah, and there's different forests uh, are owned by different entities, different governments, you know, federal, in, in the United States case, federal, state, private landowners. And then, like you said, there are different use cases for those forests. Like not every forest is an actively managed forest for logging. Not every forest is completely set aside and untouched. Uh, what kind of forest do you work with? Yeah, great question. Uh, we work in the boreal forest uh, primarily. So we have a, a 3.9 million hectare project uh, in the north of British Columbia, right at the 60th parallel. Um, so just a little south or, or west of, of the Alaskan Peninsula, uh, butting up to the Yukon Territory. And uh, it is a, an unmanaged boreal forest that's available for sanctioned logging. And what we've seen in British Columbia is perhaps uh, similar to other states like Washington and Oregon, uh, there's perhaps been over harvesting at times and then maybe under harvesting at times. So we, again, we have things out of whack. Um, and so we're working with indigenous partners who have right and title to that land and have existed on the land since time immemorial um, to improve things. And they'd like to see it set aside, but they've admitted that there needs to be an active management component. Um, which means that we do have to extract trees if we're going to do our job as good stewards uh, to increase the carbon sequestration potential of that forest. And so it's all about finding the harmony. Um, and Canada's tricky because we have all this land tied up in this thing called the crown, um, which is this sort of nebulous concept when, when, when Britain and France decided to become a country so they could prevent being taken over by the U.S. back in the 1812 days. Um, they, they founded a country and uh, we were Commonwealth British country um, and then eventually became our own thing. Um, but we have all this unsettled uh, land claim treaties. And, and what that means is that a lot of Canada ends up being de facto unmanaged, which is a real problem. And if you contrast that, like Brady said, uh, to the United States, where it's all fairly clear, you've got tribal, federal, state, private, uh, you know, maybe a park code thrown in there, but that's about it, five or six types of, of land. In Canada, we have private, uh, we have uh, federal Indian reserve, um, and we have uh, this thing called the crown. Um, and, and it's very tricky because it's held um, in trust uh, until these land claims are settled. And so in BC, where I live, we've been able to carve out a process to actually get in and start managing those lands rather than just leave them to do their thing. And I think that's a a trend is that our indigenous partners have recognized that things aren't going so well and so that somebody needs to step up and, and take care of the forests. And we have this beautiful mechanism called the carbon credit where it doesn't have to be taxpayers funding this project, but actual uh, good stewards companies come in and want to buy credits that allow us to do these improvement works and build new types of economies and communities that have struggled in the past. So that's the the basic rough idea is you sell these these parcels that have that are being watched to these companies to 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 save them because maybe they're very tax excuse me not tax that carbon um carbon heavy heavy the, these types of companies or are other companies coming to you like is there you know do you have to meet a certain threshold to to i guess buy one carbon credit no, in fact, there's various projects where if you were to Google today that you wanted to offset your personal uh, uh, greenhouse gas footprint, uh, you wanted to buy some carbon credits, there's a number of retail platforms you can go to um, that allow you to put your information in. It gives you a calculation and a little report. Um, and then you can choose as a family, as an individual, as a business to offset your, your carbon footprint. Um, so that's a pretty neat concept, I think. And uh, the challenge is you always want to know what you're buying. And so um, you don't want generic brand X. You want to make sure that you're buying something that actually does demonstrate and, and creates a real value and real sequestration. And that's something we're cautious with. Um, but our market, because of our size, is typically with large scale emitters. And as we say, we, we're looking for partners, not emitters. We're looking for people that want to partner meaningfully in the land and tell the story about our partners, the Casca. And, uh, and the work that they're doing to restore their land and the work that we guide through technology and our experience as good foresters. Two-part question, how much is one carbon credit? And then also, what could an average, any everyday person do to benefit the, the world, whether that be, uh, you know, purchase a carbon credit, plant a tree, 
Um, what, what's the best way that a person can help, like help with the environment and capture carbon? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, pricing runs the gamut, uh, from, from, you know, a, a less than a dollar, uh, right up to, uh, something called a, a CORC or a, an offset renewable certificate, which is based on biochar, which is, a a product that's a byproduct or a byproduct of, of, um, of uh, forest products where it's, you know, taking bark and turning it into a soils amendment of, of description. And those can go up for, uh, as, a, as anywhere as high as $500, uh, a credit, uh, still based on that math that everybody agreed to, uh, way back in the Kyoto days, that one metric ton of CO2 offset or sequestered, um, we in the forest business tend to see pricing somewhere between, and it is soup to nuts still, and sometimes it's nuts, uh, but we still see pricing in about that 15 USD per uh, carbon credit. Um, and we talk about credits, offsets, a metric ton of CO2 sequestered or avoided. They're, they're all interchangeable in terms of language. Um, so if you hear someone buying offsets, it's the same as a credit. It's the same concept. Second part of your question, what's the best thing you can do? Um, you know, our motto really has been, uh, let's do things different slash better. Um, so whether it's, um, if you don't have to make it a second time around, that's a good decision. Um, so I think the work that mass timber group is doing advocating for things that last a long, a lot longer is better. Um, in the wood business, uh, we look at the products that you can develop from a tree. Um, and about the worst rating we have is paper packaging, things that biodegrade within one to two years really don't last, um, because they take a lot of energy to, you know, you still have the footprint of harvesting, manufacturing, and then putting that tree back into the ground and getting it growing again. And that's sometimes as much as a 27 to 30 year cycle faster, obviously, when you're closer to the equator. Um, you know, where in the Amazon, those trees can, can, uh, be huge, uh, uh, vessels growing very quickly, a lot slower. We are in the boreal forest where you might only get, um, a minimum of degree growing days where you can actually support good growth. And so we'll have forests that are 300 years old and the trees are only 15 feet tall. You know, think the tundra or the Arctic, we're a little bit south of that. Uh, but we can have some pretty stunted trees uh, because it's just really hard to replenish those trees. And I think that's a good example as we use in our own lives. Uh, whatever you can do to reduce or reuse is a good thing. Um, so whether you're buying, um, you know, a, a shirt, uh, look for the manufacturer that, you know, you can own and perhaps, you know, the, the net color doesn't stretch out because we ordered our shirts off of some website and we got five for 25 or what have you. Versus buying a t-shirt that will last, you know, a good five years or something of that nature. Um, so it just comes down to the small decisions. I don't think there's any one silver bullet. Um, obviously I'm a fan of planting trees. If you get a chance, uh, nothing better than, than, especially as a family, uh, gathering around and talking about it and perhaps buying a seedling and watching that tree grow up because you don't see, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, things happening for the first five years, but I think it's the same in life that people tend to overestimate what happens in the first five, and then they underestimate what happens between five and 15. And that's really when we see tro trees start to grow and to, uh, to sack on or to pound on uh, um, uh, carbon and really become something. So um, if you have the opportunity to plant a tree, I'm always a fan. And you talked a lot about, about what people can do in our daily lives, kind of on a voluntary basis. Um, but there are a lot of regulations coming down, specifically in the built environment, which is one of the largest contributors to these emissions. What do you see the trends for carbon regulation look like uh, in Canada and then maybe on a little bit more broad scale, if you can speak to it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, everybody in, on the globe is is competing. So we heard of the, of the cops um, where it seems like the elites gather with their private planes in a place that maybe isn't necessarily the most carbon friendly. Um, and talk about what they're going to do to us, the masses. And that can be challenging, uh, maybe a hard pill to swallow. We just tend to focus on doing our things, making forests better because we think everybody loves trees and, and, uh, go from that basis. But, uh, regulations are coming in different form or fashion in the U S the SEC is flagged, uh, that they expect companies to be reporting on their carbon footprint. 
Uh, and because of the unique nature of the United States, the fact that it's a broad based coalition of 50 different states, it's always challenging to see if there's going to be a broad based federal regulation or if that's something that can actually get agreed to um, in, in your Congress. Um, in Canada, it's a little bit different. Um, our government at the federal level did impose a carbon tax and excuse me, and every jurisdiction um, it, all of our provinces, which are roughly equal to states. Um, are responsible to uh, make cer or to meet certain goals, certain emissions targets for their provinces. And so some that's easy because they don't have much going on um, and small populations. Um, and others, it's tough, particularly in energy producing districts. And so obviously Alberta would have a parallel to Texas or Alaska um, where there's a significant amount of forest, um, but there's also a significant uh, component of GHG attached to the Alberta oil sands and things of that nature. Um, so Alberta has its own system, much like California has its own system, and some of the eastern states have their own systems. Um, we haven't seen unified regulation, and there's never been agreement at a global level as to what that looks like. Uh, probably the most developed carbon market on the planet is the Eurozone or the ETS scheme where every business is allotted a certain amount of carbon uh, and then they have to go into a, a, essentially a market and buy what they can't reduce and that price is set. Um, and right now, um, you know, carbon offsets in the Eurozone, the ETS scheme trade for somewhere in between, they've been as high as 100 euro, uh, so fairly comparable to the US dollar. Um, so a significant impact to businesses um, we think the regulations are getting tougher in Canada. We have a, a gazetted raise. Uh, the carbon tax goes up by 15 bucks every year until 2030. It's supposed to be $170 a ton. Um, so that's going to be really challenging for businesses. We think the terminal price of carbon has to be a lot lower to gain acceptance, um, and, 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 and allow also allow the consumer. And that's one thing that we're advocating for now is that we don't really want to see businesses pay a tax. Instead, we'd love to see them buy offsets because then we can, as good business owners, negotiate. And so if you're faced with paying a $60 tax and perhaps you can invest in a carbon offset project that creates real value and economy for people, as well as sequestering carbon, and you could buy that for a 20% discount, you should be allowed to do that as a consumer. So that's the challenge in the market today is it's very fractured. Um, Nick, you mentioned buying a carbon offset. There's not one centralized market around the planet. Uh, Australia has its own scheme. The Eurozone obviously has its own scheme. And then there's a lot of talk about Article 6 um, at the UN uh, when these countries get together for their, their annual COP meetings. Um, and that would be an agreement so that a Canadian offset could work in the US or a US offset. Uh, one developed in Idaho, for instance, would work in um, Sumatra or pick a place. And, and that's the challenge is getting a unified market, uh, which we don't necessarily see happening. Uh, we think that it'll just continue to trade much like oil does where there are some unified markets. Uh, but, you know, you have Brent Crude and you have Western Canadian Select, you have uh, West Texas Intermediate, et cetera, et cetera, um, where there's different marketplaces for different types of offsets. Um, so we think it'll remain fractured. Um, it'd be nice to think that it could be centralized one day. Um, but we're in early days of, uh, what we would call a brand new commodity. So similar to crypto where Bitcoin's now having its, uh, it's having its resurgence because it's getting uh, wide scale acceptance through ETFs. Um, perhaps one day the, the day will come for carbon offsets where there's more of a unified market. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that, you know, unfolds over the next decade or so. Like you said, like different emerging technologies, if you will, or, or concepts or commodities like crypto, like go through that, that wild west period where there's, they're scattered. They're not really uh, a whole lot of people paying attention to it. But then, you know, once the tension is there and once the, the perceived risk is removed, you know, it's wild to see what happens. How does somebody go from working in AI? Uh, or having a background in wood to like merging into this path? Like what did your journey look like to get into this space? Yeah, I ask myself that often. Um, I've always been an early adopter of technology, but I didn't think I'd work specifically in technology. Um, it started because I'm fourth generation in the woods. So I grew up in a logging family and uh, 
know, my dad was born in Roseburg, Oregon in timber country. And my grandfather uh, liked to wander around and cut down trees and work in logging camps all up and down um, uh, the Pacific coast. So in the Sequoias and the Redwoods to the Douglas Fir uh, in, in Roseburg, and then all the way up through to Haida Gwaii, uh, formerly the Queen Charlotte Islands, as well as the coast of British Columbia and up through the interior. So, uh, my family wandered around for a while before settling here and, uh, timber has been in the blood for a, a long time. Uh, but the problem of maybe a bit with British Columbia is that we had such a significant, vast timber resource, um, that it wasn't necessarily the most well-managed. And I think anyone with a, a good sensibility starts to recognize that you can do things different slash better. Um, so I had a lot of whys, like, well, why do we sell to these guys when we couldn't sell to those guys? And why is there so much waste in this process? There doesn't seem to be as much waste in the Scandinavian countries. Now, granted, they don't have the vast resource, nor do they, have, but they have, and they have a lot more population. Um, so it's a lot easier. Canada is a huge country with very little population. It's one of the least dense places in the world. Um, so perhaps we developed the, the ability to be a bit more wasteful and less thoughtful. Um, so when you look at that and, and through that lens and you start thinking, well, okay, if I'm going to do my part, what would that look like? I, I still am a big fan of wood products and they can actually be a real big solution, um, to some of the carbon intensity, uh, of, of the, one of the things that are not getting built today. So how can we do that in a way that would self-sustain perhaps? And so, um, I've had a diverse background. I've worked in renewable energy on the hydropower side of things and, uh, met a lot of great people, uh, along the way started to think that maybe we could get a forest improvement project. And that had to be timed with the fact that the carbon market was growing, um, to the point where an offset was actually worthwhile because before, uh, an offset was worth perhaps a dollar, it was really hard to get the economics to work, uh, fast forward to 2020 when we started. And, uh, the prices were high enough and we saw a movement and a social movement, um, about responsibility and, and holding people accountable for the decisions. And perhaps that would allow us to sort of float into a marketplace that ex could accept the higher price because it, it's expensive to rejuvenate the forest and just a lot of it's not getting done. I think that's my frustration too, is that, uh, there's a lot of things that we could be doing and we just have avoided because of the regulation because of the maturity of the industry, um, because uh, the wood products companies uh, are so sophisticated and so well financed these days that they're able to move in and out of different jurisdictions. So perhaps these forests aren't as important to them anymore. Um, and so the improvement works just aren't happening. Um, when I was a kid and I first started in the logging industry, there was a lot of uh, spacing and that's sort of one of the entry level jobs where you'd go out into an immature stand and you would select, um, the most, um, the, the tree poised to do the best, you know, though, though you're, you were selecting out the, the best looking tree and then you would cut, um, all the little trees down around it so that again, it would get more sunlight on all four quadrants. It would not have to compete as much for new, uh, nutrients for moisture, things of that nature. And, um, that work was prolific and uh, the whole town was just ready to go to work to do that type of thing. Um, and it just started to taper off more and more and more and, uh, to the point where I just don't see any of it anymore. And that was really cause for concern. We saw more use of, uh, glycos, uh, glycosulfates, um, you know, let's poison the underbrush so that we can help these trees, uh, proliferate things of that nature. And I'm not saying that's all bad. I'm not here to judge that. But I know that we can do our part and do things different slash better, um, better use. Perhaps we don't cut trees down to send them back to Canada in the form of uh, Amazon packaging. Uh, perhaps we can just reduce and the stuff that is left over, we can manufacture for things that last a little bit longer, um, you know, than, than housing developments that get knocked down or completely rebuilt after 50 years. Maybe that wasn't the best thing to do to start with. And. You can't unwind the clock. Um, you can't roll back the clock and, 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 and throw cast dispersion or judgment on people who are just making decisions, living their lives in the moment, but you can choose to do different with your actions. And that's really what led me to do this. If you were to point somebody down the road of, of finding out more information about carbon credits or 
just in general, get spun up and learn about the industry itself. Is there, is there kind of like a, you know, a couple of websites that come to mind or maybe a couple of books or places that you'd send somebody to learn? Yeah, I think, uh, our friends at carboncredits.com do a great job, uh, explaining it. There's a, a guide that you can download that walks you through the basics of it. I think that's really exciting. And then any high quality forest based, uh, carbon offset project, uh, including, including our website. So carbonethic.io. Uh, we've been excited to have visitors and, uh, there's just a lot of great resources. People have done a way better job describing how this works, uh, than I have, but, um, essentially there's a lot of great information out there. Um, you'll also see the controversy and, and I encourage people to always read the, the articles from the guardian, uh, and the responses from a scientific perspective to say what they got right, what they got wrong. Um, because oftentimes when an industry is brand new, um, it gets a bad rap. And, uh, I think that it had happened. Um, and perhaps scared people of the industry, yet it is so necessary to making things better for, for all people moving forward. Yeah. I liked what you said about, uh, you can't go back or prejudge people based on the decisions that they made in the moment, but you can change your actions to do different slash better. On that note, if you could change anything about the industry right now, what would it be and why? Yeah, this is something we're trying to solve. So, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the saying that uh, problems are opportunities. Um, so when I look back, um, I think perhaps if we could have gone and done better uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, extraction and, and higher end products, maybe we'd be further along as an economy. Um, and that's why I'm such a fan of mass timber. And, I, and I'm, one of the things I'm really curious about is... Mm. What is the highest and best use of a tree that needs to be extracted? Um, and that's why I'm so interested and such a big fan of what you guys are doing um, is if we had to cut a tree down, which in many cases we do, either to prevent a wildfire event, build some resilience, or just get more sunlight on a tree, let the other trees not have to compete so much. What do we do with that tree? And the answer typically has been, well, if you're, if you don't have a market, you burn it. If you do have a market, you send it to a sawmill, it becomes a thing. And we thought, well, if we could have a say over that thing, wouldn't that be neat? So when we de develop a carbon credit, we actually have to look at the trees that we're taking out and we have to account for the emissions of taking that tree out, um, plus the emissions, um, that are involved in, in whatever that product becomes. The manufacturing process, did they use a lot of chemicals? How far was it transported? So there's a lot of elements that go into this. And so we thought, well, maybe the doing differently is how we think about what we would do with that tree. And, and you and I have talked a little bit about, um, can we come up with a universal design for mass timber so that the highest and best use for that tree actually becomes housing for people and perhaps affordable housing uh, for our indigenous partners or people in communities that are really struggling, because it doesn't seem like a lot of people are, uh, are, are answering the affordable housing issue. So if we had to cut a tree down and we could design something to do with it, well, the, the highest and best use, in my opinion, is to put it in something that is well insulated, is warm, but is also beautiful and a place where people want to live. And perhaps that's a 200 year structure. So then when I go to my accounting page, I can say, well, instead of it becoming pulp and paper or perhaps, um, scab lumber for, uh, for, uh, uh, concrete, you know, whalers and strongbacks that just get thrown away after a single use, uh, if it actually went into a CLT plant and became something that lasted for 200 years, well, Hey, that's almost like not cutting it down minus the emissions to get it to that place. And could we change that? And ultimately the dream is, well, if that was the solution, could we wind back the clock and have done that 50, a hundred years ago, you know, times have changed, but that's what I think we can do differently. So then we get into this whole circular picture where instead of manufacturing the forest or, or rather treating the forest, like an input source for boards, we could see the whole picture and say, well, that forest is about ready to tip over in terms of its, its effectiveness at sequestering carbon, because when trees die off, they emit CO2. So a little known fact, yet it's very common. Uh, so tre trees are only positive sequestration sources for so long, and then they tip the balance and become net emitters. Um, so could we catch those trees when they're at their highest and best use and then turn around and save them 
uh, into, into a house, into something that's beautiful and affordable for the next 200 years. That's what we want to work towards and pulling that all together and then seeing the waste wood, um, become a product like biochar, which again, we can sell a credit for and becomes a soils amendment to help, uh, retain moisture. And, and actually it acts as a fertilizer, uh, that's a natural product for, for trees. So we could tie that whole system together, not just forest improvement and conservation, but also tying it together. Um, with providing affordable housing and things that last for hundreds of years, that's beautiful and attractive. And also the waste byproduct could go into energy, perhaps renewable fuel or a soils amendment to increase the growing even more. Well, then we'd won. So we're trying to save the world in our own small way, um, which is a lot of fun to, to think about. And, and that's why it's great to talk mass timber. Well, I know maybe it wouldn't be appropriate for everybody to maybe contact you, you know, as the CEO of the Carbon Ethic Group, but is there an email or is there somewhere where people could go to help support the mission? Absolutely, Nick. Uh, you can find us uh, info at carbonethic.io. And there's obviously a, a, a form on our website too that you can fill out. And we love talking carbon. We love talking trees. We love talking how we can do different slash better. So hit us up. And of course we're on uh, all the socials as well. Um, and we do a fairly good job of, uh, of keeping people updated on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I connected with mass timber group and have been following you guys for quite some time, enjoying the pod and, uh, and, uh, really the work that you're doing advocating for, I think a product that needs to be, um, pushed because it's so innovative and, uh, you know, it's been around in other places, but we've just really not gotten the traction. And if we do get the traction, it's typically in signature projects. We have a 12, uh, 12 story building called Brock Commons that gets a lot of press, but I'm more interested in the, what is the, you know, the 10 house townhouse that we can, you know, fold out quickly and get up and running for people quickly. And so, uh, love the stuff that you guys are doing for advocacy for something that I think is really necessary. Well, thank you kindly for saying that. Is there anything that we could help on our end, uh, support you? We're looking, uh, for partners, uh, in developing some, some, uh, mass timber products and we're a green shield opportunity. We have unlimited sources of wood. So we're always looking for people that can help us explore the architectural and structural end of things so that perhaps there's a group that could come together, um, not only to support our goals, but to support each other. So we want to stay tight and close to you guys and the industry. And watch what unfolds, because again, I go back to that. What is the highest and best use of a tree? And if it's getting to the point where it can't sequester any more carbon, it's getting to that tipping point. Can we put it into something else that lasts for a couple hundred years? So we'd love to be part of a working group and uh, big, big fans of the industry. And we'll just keep uh, watching what happens. Uh, we love trees, but if they do have to be removed, which we know they do in, in some form or fashion at certain points in time, Let's put them into the highest and best use possible. That's huge. Well, yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Anywhere we can fit into help, that's where we'd like to be. So really appreciate your time, Brent. And um, we'll see you out there on uh, uh, helping shape the industry forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, gents.